this day to come and worship him in spirit and in truth. Thank God to be in the presence of our brothers and sisters from the Adams Avenue Amen. congregation. And we thank God for Brother Bates, Amen. who serves as their minister. Uh, we thank him for leading us in song today, along with our brother, uh, Brother Conley. And we are here to worship God in spirit and in truth. I don't know about you. I don't know how your week was, but my week was trying, but I'm still praising God. Is that all right? God is a good God, and he's good all the time. Amen. Uh, let us together pray. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for loving us in spite of us. For loving us, Heavenly Father, at times when we don't even love ourselves. And we pray and we call upon your Holy Spirit to be with us now as we look into your inspired word, which is able to save our souls. Father, we pray that you would enlighten us and that our minds and our hearts uh, be focused on you and you alone. Father God, so many times throughout life, each and every day, we're so bombarded with the things, with the cares and concerns of this life, that many times, Heavenly Father, we're beset not only by the sins, but the weights of this life. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that our mind and our focus be on you right now. Help us, dear God, with all of our getting this day to get understanding of your word that we may apply it to our lives. We pray now, Heavenly Father, for any amongst us who have not obey the gospel, that something that can be said to prick their hearts to obey the gospel today before it's everlasting too late. As we look into the topic of the greatest investment ever made, we pray, Heavenly Father, that we be mindful of the price that was paid for each of our souls. Thank you, Jesus. We ask this prayer in faith in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The greatest investment ever made. The word of God in the book of Mark, chapter 8, in a verse 36 and 37 says, For what shall a man, or what shall it profit a man, if he shall gain the whole world, and lose, watch this, his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Understand no matter what men may invest their riches in, there are some things that money just can't buy. Is that all right? That's why I want to call your attention to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, and I want to read uh, verses 18 and 19, and then we'll pick up with the context of this scripture text, okay? 1 Peter, chapter 1, starting with verse 18. If you have it, say amen. amen. The word of God says, for as much as ye know, is that what your Bible says? For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation or your vain conduct or your vain life or behavior received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Peter comes to these verses here after he has first began to encourage and reinforce to these saints how much salvation, their salvation, was at stake. He's encouraging them, he's reinforcing them about the goal of our faith. And the goal of all of our faith, amen, whatever we do in life, whatever we through, do through the week as children of God, the goal of our faith, the goal of what we're living for God for is to attain salvation. You see, what I'm working for is not anything in this life. 
Because some of us, we want to have our cake and eat it too. We want to have everything perfect down here and then go on to perfection. But I'm here to tell you, there's some things that we have to suffer down here in order to make it up there. Is that all right? And sometimes because we don't know, amen, our value, sometimes we forfeit things down here because we don't know how valuable we are to God. Amen. I don't know about you, but when I was coming up, every time I left the house, my father would say, act like you got some sense. Is that all right? Know who you belong to, in other words. Amen. Because you know when you left the house, amen, you know that you were representing your family. And you didn't want to disappoint your family name. Oh, that's JoJo's boy. Oh, hell, that's JoJo's boy right there. Is that right? You were representing your household. And your, your, your family's name. Is that right? And we have to recognize that as children of God, we're representing our father. But the question is, do you look like your father? Do you act like your father? Because I'm here to tell you, even in the church, amen, all of us don't have the same father. Jesus, when talking to the Pharisees, says, you are of your father, the devil. And his work you will do. Is that right? Amen. Amen. He's encouraging them, reinforcing and exhorting them, even through the necessary trying of their faith, because these saints were going through a lot of things. Amen. And I don't need to know your business, but I know you're going through some things this morning. Is that right? And he's exhorting them, even through the trying of your faith, even through all that you're going through. Amen. Amen. Understand and be mindful. Remain focused on the goal of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. All right. You see, we have to understand one thing about Christianity. Christianity, amen, is not just designed or, or doctrine to uh, design to make us wiser, but it's to make us new. We ought to walk in the newness of life. If I'm walking in the newness of life, if I'm a child of God, there should be some evidence. There should be some proof. Amen. In my walk. And we're not saying that you got it all together and you're perfect and everything's fine now. We're all a work in progress. Is that right? But notice the word work in progress, not a work in regress. Is that all right? Work in progress. So notice what he says. Because I want to kind of continue what Brother Willie did so profoundly last week in talking about perspective. And he shared with us the importance of not removing the thorn because the thorn is meant to help you. Is that right? But in order to be able to bear up under the thorn, you have to have the right perspective. Your mind has to be right. Otherwise, you'll go through your Christian life murmuring and complaining about everything you endure. And it, we know that it's not charged to us. We're not instructed as Christians, children of God, to murmur and complain. We have to have the right attitude, the right mindset. Is that right? Watch what he says. First Peter chapter one, verse 13. He says. After encouraging them about their salvation. And making sure that their focus remains on the goal of their faith, which is their salvation. He says this. He says, gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, in, other words, in order to accomplish the goal of, of their salvation, they would need to possess the right mindset. And I'm here to tell you the, the greatest thing that we're struggling with today is not the things that are happening to us in the world. The greatest thing, the battle is right here. It's in our mind. So he says, gird up the loins of your mind. Is that right? Now, we need to understand this. What does this mean? Gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins is a term that truly meant to tie up one's loose outward garment as a prerequisite before they would go to work. In other words, you're, you're tying up things and you're preparing to do some work. 
And what he said to them, if you're going to live for God, if you're going to make heaven your home, you have to tie up some loose ends in your mind. In other words, you can't have, we used to say, loose screws. Y'all remember things like that? you got to get it together. People used to say sometimes, get your mind right. Is that right? Before you do some things, before children, before you go off to college, before you get your mind, before you go off to a career, you have to get your mind right. You have to prepare yourself. Because there's some things coming that you don't expect will come. So he says, gird up the loins of your mind. It means to, again, tie up the outward garments before you're able to work unencumbered. In other words, you want to have your mind right so that nothing impedes your progress, so that nothing hinders you. Is that right? It, it had a, a, a reference to, and you hear it sometimes, rolling up your sleeves. Before you do some work, what do you do? You roll up your sleeves so that you don't, nothing gets in the way of what you're about to do. Is that right? Are we getting this? Now watch this. Now, while our mind truly can't roll up no sleeves, amen, all right, our mind can and must be informed, it must be disciplined, and it must be prepared in the service of the Most High God. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Wherefore seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside, is that right? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that was that is set before us. So in other words, in order to run this race with patience, we're going to have to make sure, make sure some things in our lives are in order and together. Is that right? And when you continue to read in uh, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, he says, looking unto Jesus, right? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Then he says, consider him. So in other words, in your life, living for God, we have to always be mindful of Jesus Christ. It's unwise for us to look at one another. And that's what sometimes we do. And that's why we get so messed up. Because we're trying to compare ourselves by ourselves, and that's unwise, the Bible says. So we ought to consider Jesus lest we grow weary and faint in our minds. You see, I don't know about you, but every time I measure myself up to Christ, I always come up short. And honestly and truly, there's nothing I can complain about, justly anyway. When I look at Jesus, amen, he was persecuted, he was afflicted, and he did nothing wrong, amen. Watch this, our mind in serving God needs to be together, not scattered, which causes us to waver, amen. As I said earlier in the prayer, we have so many things in our life that is grabbing our attention. And, and I, I truly believe that a lot of the work and service for the Lord is, is being neglected, not necessarily all the time because of sinful lives, but because of busy lives. Many times, if we're honest about it, we're just too busy to serve God. I got this going on. I got that going on. Uh, I'll try to fit God in there somewhere. But soon as something goes wrong in my life, Father, I need you. Lord, have mercy. Is that right? We want him to be there immediately. But God is saying to you and I, where were you when I need you? I have a world of people that have created in my own image. And they're dying every day. And I need you as my vessel. You are my child. I need you to be a light to them. I need you to be an example to them. But yet you don't have time for me. Watch this. He says again in verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your minds. Be sober. Be clear-minded. Be, be clear 
clear-minded. Watch out. Be careful that you don't allow things to affect your mind. Amen. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We got to be aware of what we put in our minds. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. Is that all right? Watch this. James 1.8 says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. If you're one way one minute, one way the next minute, there, there's some issues going on that we need to pray about. Is that all right? God is looking for us to grow and work towards, amen, and this doesn't happen overnight, but we ought to be working towards consistency in our lives. Is that right? Isaiah, watch this. Isaiah 20, 26 and verse 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. In other words, when you and I stay our minds on the Lord, he will keep us in perfect peace. Have you ever noticed no matter what hell is going on in your life, when you have a right relationship with God, when you're in line with God, no matter what's going on in your life, you're at peace. But when your mind is not staying on the Lord, amen, woke up this morning with my mind, is that right? Stayed on the Lord. When your mind is stayed on the Lord, no matter what comes your way, you're able to handle it. By the grace of God, you are. Is that right? But as soon as you lose focus like Peter did, amen, and walking on the water and walking to Jesus, as soon as we pay attention to the winds of the world, amen, and to what Jojo and them saying down the street about me, then we start to lose focus and we start to sink. And God is trying to say, I don't want you worried about the people at your job and what they're trying to do to you. I don't want you to worry about your family and what they're saying. Amen. Now that you're trying to live your life for God, I want you to focus on me. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on thee. Watch this. Because he trusted in thee. You see, I'm learning. Amen. Y'all pray for me. I'm learning how to trust in God. Because many times you think you trust God. Am I talking? To, let me go over here. Many times you think you trust God and to God allows you to go through an experience that shows you that you didn't trust him like you thought you did. Is that all right? Watch this. We have to remember, amen, where the battle really is. All right, I want you to go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting with verse 3. All right, we forget a lot of times, and, I, and I'm, I'm really on this because uh, this is issues that not only do we have in our families, in our, in our workplace, in our communities, amen, and even in the church, unfortunately, but we focus so much on people. And understand that people... You and I are not the enemy. Is that all right? Whatever issues, whatever thing we got going on, you and I are not the enemy. But you better believe this. There is an enemy. Is that all right? Second Corinthians chapter 10, starting with verse 3. If you have it, say amen. Watch what the Bible says. Paul is talking. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So in other words, our battle, our battle, our war is not physical. I know sometimes we get hot and bothered and we want to get physical. Up, even up in here. Amen. Is that right? We want to lay hands on people and not, not the holy hands. Is that right? Our war is not physical. But watch this. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through who? God. Through God to the pulling down of what? Of what? Watch this. What is, we say, what are what really our strongholds? Some of us, watch this, some of us have indulged in, in certain sins for so long that they just have a hold on us. 
Y'all know what I'm talking about? Amen. amen. You can say amen. 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 We have some things that just held on to us. Amen. Almost like we married to them. You've been dealing with this. You've been asking God to help you since 1985. And this thing still like Jason, like Michael Myers, just still coming up and getting you. It won't die. Is that right? But the weapons we have, you understand, the weapons God has given us is able to pull these things down. Is that right? Watch this. Casting down imaginations or reasoning. These are philosophies of men. Because sometimes we can get so high and mighty and think we know everything. Y'all don't know nobody like that, so let's move on. <laughs> Casting down imaginations and every, watch this, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You see, there's some traditions and doctrines of men that oppose the very word of God. And you have a lot of people following these things because they think, well, he's he's smart. He's very wise. He went to Harvard. He went to Yale. I don't care if you haven't went to the school of Jesus. You really don't know nothing. Is that all right? And I'm not knocking education. Get your education. You need it. Amen. Is that right? All right. He says. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing, watch this, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, that's the issue, because if you're anything like me, what really gets you is your mind races. Is that right? Even at times when you're praying, your mind is going 100 miles an hour. We need to be honest about these things because sometimes you will go to God in prayer and you'll pray that God will keep your heart and your mind. And as, you, as soon as you say amen, you go right back to worrying. And God is saying, I want to keep your heart and your mind. Is that right? It's a mind thing. Our perspective, our mindset, our attitude has to be conditioned by the word of God. Amen. And he's encouraging this and he's encouraging them to holiness. Amen. He's saying, listen, get your mind together because you need to understand and don't take lightly that your life needs to be a reflection of the God you serve. In other words, your behavior has to be of that conducive to what your father is. In other words, whose child are you? Does your life reflect whose child you are? We have a screen up here. If I was to pull this screen down and we put a projector of your life and my life, what will we see? From what we see, not on Sundays, I'm talking about Monday through Saturday. Is that all right? Monday through Saturday, what do we see? Do we see a portrayal of one who is a child of God or the child of someone else? What will we see? Now, I don't need to worry about you. I need to worry about my own projection. And the problem is we got so many people talking about, oh, put Yukons up there. Let's see Yukon. No, you need to worry about yourself. <laughs> You're saying put everybody else up there so we don't put up yours. Amen. Is that all right? But he's encouraging them. Amen. Romans 12, 2, we know it. And be not conformed to this world. Be not fashioned to this world, but be ye what? Transformed by the what? You have to renew your mind. There's no way that you and I can come into the body of Christ, be baptized, amen, and not give ourselves to learning what God would have us to do. And that's a process, and that's hard, because as I shared yesterday in our, in our uh, Perfecting the Saints classes, understand that at the same time that you're learning about God, you have to unlearn some things that you've been raised and taught all your life. Is that right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm treating my wife better now. Amen, because I'm employing what God's word teaches. 
Now, my earthly father taught me never let a woman rule you. Is that right? And as soon as I said I do, I know that that don't work. That don't work. Brothers, you can say amen. That don't work. I have to listen to my, my real father who told me to love my wife as Christ has loved the church. And watch this, brothers. As soon as I started doing that, dinner was ready. <laughs> Amen. All these nice things are happening. And I'm wondering why I didn't listen years ago. Took me five years to realize I should employ what God told me. Are y'all hearing this? Amen. I'm telling y'all the truth. Watch this. He says, renew your mind that, watch this, it's for a purpose. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. Guess what? Everything you and I knew up until the time we were baptized into Christ, it does, doesn't mean a hill of beans in our life for Christ. In other words, what you knew in the world, your street smarts and everything else, it ain't going to matter in this life. It's not going to matter. All right? Now you have to be taught God's way to live and do what's pleasing and acceptable with God because sometimes we, when we were in the world, we thought we knew what was pleasing to God. Is that right? Many of us used to say, well, I just study at home. I worship at home. Where do you see that in God's word? You don't see that nowhere. They worship house to house, but not by themselves. Is that right? Fellowship is a commandment. It's not an option. Is that right? Okay. All right. Hebrews 12, 14 says, and I'm hastening, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You see, when Peter gets to verse 17 in 1 Peter chapter 1, he says, if you call on, call on the Father who without respect of persons judges, all right, judgeth according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning here in fear. In other words, if you really acknowledge that God is your Father and you know he's judge, live your life here, because we're pilgrims in this world, right? Live your life here in reverent faith fear of God. We used to be told by our parents, do you got sense? Act like it. Are you a child of God? Act like it. Is that all right? But the thing is, when we get to verse 18, and this is the crux of what I'm saying to you, because I don't want to preach at you, I want to share God's word with you. Is that all right? He says, for as much as ye know. Here's the, here's the climax of this story. For as much as ye know. The thing is, what does he want them to know? What is it that you and I, in living our lives, must know? He says, for as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation or conduct or manner of life received by the tradition of your fathers. People are just people. Is that right? And they've been acting, ain't nothing new under the sun. Is that right? Things have been passed on from generation to generation and it's still wicked. Sometimes we think because we're here in 2016 that it's just so much worse. It was bad back then. They just didn't have Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff. Is that right? People were still sinning back then. Is that right? Are we getting this? He's saying, understand your value. And that's what I want to share with you right now. Understand your value. And I'm here to tell you, in the field, y'all know that I work in the field of mental health. I've worked with children, now I'm working with adults. And I'm telling you, behavior is a reflection in many cases of a person's self-worth. 
They live according to how they value themselves. And because a lot of young women today don't value themselves, they give themselves up freely for what they think is love. And I just don't want to put it on the young women because a lot of young men don't value themselves. And they think what's really cool and in is to try to sleep with every girl in the school. And because they have no sense of their value, amen, that's how they live. And the same thing is true of children of God. When we don't know our value, we'll live as we did in our former lives. And Peter is telling these saints, don't live like you used to live because you've been bought with a price. Do you understand how valuable you are? And many of us, we come in week in and week out looking like we just sucked on lemons all week. (laughs) Because we just don't know how valuable we are. And I'm not preaching arrogance here because the Bible tells us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Is that right? But I'm saying, do you know your worth? Do you know how much you cost God? Do you know how much God values you? All right. Because when you look at this word redeem, let's 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 deal with this. Redeem means to ransom to deliver or purchase, set free one who is captive or in bondage. In other words, the design of, of, of Jesus shedding his blood, his most precious blood, was to redeem us or to buy us back. Because we were captives. We were in bondage. We were slaves. You say, well, I've never been a slave. Yes, you were. You were a slave to sin. You were living in a life of sin and there was nothing you can do about it. And you still see people who are living in ignorance and they come and they say, well, you know, well, I come, I'll be baptized. You know, I'll, I'll come to the church when I get my life together. You can't get it together. Is that right? I don't see no one going down to Cleveland Clinic with an issue and saying, hey, I'll come back when I, when I fix this cancer on my own. You can't fix it. That's why you need the therapy. Amen. We're all in need of therapy. And I'm talking about the spiritual therapy. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Watch this. Redeemed. And shedding his his blood again was to redeem us not only from eternal misery after this life, but also he came to redeem us from a vain conversation in this life. In other words, God wants us to start living as his children, not when we get to heaven. He wants us to start living it now. Now, you're children of the most high God right now. Act like it. Is that right? And and many times we struggle because we just don't know. All right. People just don't know their worth. You see, you have to understand. Watch this. What determines the value of a thing is not the perception of a collective group of people. Because in life, values are put on certain things, right? There's values of cars, houses. You know, sometimes the market is set by whatever a group of people think the value should be set, right? But understand this. The actual thing that we need to understand is this. You know, again, let me, let me just read this. What determines the value of a thing is not the perception of a collective group, but what determines the value is the actual price which is paid for a thing. In other words, when you look at what God gave for our redemption to buy us back, what determines our value is the price paid for it. And when you look at the price that was paid for us, it silver or gold can't compare. Is that all right? I know y'all see the commercials where you can, you can use a commercial up in here. Pews, $40,000. Some of y'all know that. Building, 
$750,000. Salvation in Christ Jesus, priceless. Is that all right? It's priceless because nothing can compare to what God gave for you and I. And we need to understand, now watch this. If he could have, if, if anything less could have sufficed for our redemption, don't you think God would have gave it? But the truth of the matter is nothing else could suffice. It took the blood of Jesus Christ to save you and I. Watch this. I want you to look with me in 1 Peter 2. And we'll close with this. 1 Peter 2. Because he continues on in 1 Peter 2. He wants them to know their value. All right? And I'm, I'm here to tell you, as I, I said earlier, it is a sad thing that I encounter people on a daily basis who just don't know how much they're worth. Just don't know. They think they're useless. They think that they don't matter. They think that they don't count. They think, you know, I, I've, been, I've been raised. I, I don't have a father who cares. I don't have a, a mother who cares. I've been in and out the system. Amen. No one cares. These people need to know about the one who truly cares, despite all of that, that they're important, that they're valuable. Amen. Watch this. First Peter 2, 9 and 10 says, but ye are, ye are, is that right? You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are, watch this, a peculiar people. Peculiar meaning purchase. You mean something. You mean so much that God gave us only begotten son for you. You are purchased people. Amen. Watch this though. That or for the purpose of ye may show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God has called us out of the world into the church. Amen. Understand that we have an honor and privilege to be called the sons of God. Is that right? It's not a right. It's not something that's entitled to you. Is that right? It's an honor and a privilege to be in the body of Christ. I say all the time, many of us know other people, amen, who live morally better than us. But they don't know Christ. And you have to ask yourself, out of all the people you know in your world, why you? Why are you so blessed? Amen. Why are you so privileged to know God and the pardoning of your sin? You can be out there just like the rest of them. But God chose you. He allowed you to hear the word. Amen. As he does them. But you responded. You ever thought about that? Out of all your running buddies, all your homeboys, homegirls, you responded. You know Christ. Amen. And you know him in such a way now that your former life is almost like an alien. I was talking to a brother earlier this week. He said, you know, I got with some friends of mine that I've known for over 50 years. Is that right? And he just don't have nothing in common with him. When you come to know Christ, that former life is just like, what was that? And it doesn't, I'm not saying this to say that you think you're better than somebody, but it makes you so thankful that God rescued you from that empty life. That life was going nowhere. And you know it. Is that right? But God saved you. Amen. Watch what it says. Let me finish this verse. It says, which in times past were not a people. Is that right? But are now the people of God, which has not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. God be praised that he has allowed us to obtain mercy. Is that right? Now watch this. 
understand as we now grow to value ourselves, amen, and we understand how much we cost or what price we are in the sight of God, how much more, and we're going to talk about this, this, this evening, how much more should we value the lives of others? In other words, it's not enough for you and I to have come to know how much or how valuable we are. We need to understand how valuable other people are. And now that we're children of God, guess what? Everybody matters. There's a slogan going around, especially in the city of Cleveland. Lives matter. Is that right? Guess what? Souls matter more. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Souls matter more. Because that's something that will never end. All right? So we need to understand that. And recognize that what's left for us in John 3.16 rings out today all the more. That God gave his only begotten son. Is that right? Watch this. That who, whosoever should believe in him, what? Should not. Faith Builders class, you ought to know this. Should not perish. Understand that different translations use different words for that should. The should is proper. All right? Because in some translations you have shall or will not. Shall not and will not means that it's guaranteed that you won't. But should not is proper because even though God gave his son, it's a possibility that you can still perish. In other words, believing in God ain't enough. You have to live. Amen. You have to have faith and obedience. Amen. Is that all right? You say, how can I become a child of God today? You can do it today. No, you don't have to work, wait for the fourth Sunday or anything like that. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, you believe that. You can come and repent of your sins, confess that he is the son, and then in obedience be buried in baptism for the remission of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit today. Today. Amen. And watch this. If you're not sure where you stand with God, you need to ask somebody. And we're here today to, to share with you word, God's word, not our opinions, not our ideas. We want you to know what God says, not what any man says. Amen. But we wanted you to know what God says. And when we look at our lives, for those of us who have obeyed the gospel, when we look at our lives and see that we haven't been living a life according to our value, we need to repent. We need to ask God to help us. We need to ask for prayer. And truth of the matter be, we all stand in need of prayer. And many times we all live beneath our privileges that God has given us. Is that right? We can do better, and we need to strive to do better. And God is faithful to help us to do better. And guess what? It's not for any glory for us. I'm not to say, to, oh, look what I did and look what I'm able to do. No, all glory, honor, and praise is due to God. So consider.